my dear student colleagues and all the viewers for watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i'd like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar today it's our 271st international physics webinar and we have with us here today dr devi prashad choudhury sir professor department of physics and astronomy and associate director uh, san fernando observatory california state I university uh, north ridge usa and he has already connected with us so sir a good morning to your part and good evening to here so thanks for joining with us and thanks for accepting our invitation sir and this is very good opportunity for our student and the viewers to uh, listen to your uh, exciting uh, talk and they can also uh, ask question directly so sir it's your time you can start your session okay so yeah let me just one minute i'll take yeah? okay sir That's yeah good. So dear viewers and students, you can also join with us using the link. I'll send the link in the comment section and you can also ask question by commenting. Okay, so let me then start. Um, so, so you can see my slide, full slide, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. So um, today what I decided is that, you know, I will uh, speak about um, one big instrument uh, um, uh, that is being built in the United States to um, observe the sun in greater detail to understand uh, physics that is going on in our nearest star. So um, the topic is basically understanding the sun that supports our uh, that uh, supports our life on Earth. So um, uh, that uh, this uh, topic I dis um, uh, selected because uh, in astronomy, although many other things are going on, but this is one of the big things that is happening because of two reasons. One is that uh, we are building a big telescope, which uh, you will see uh, in the um, uh, right side of your screen. This is like a temple uh, of the of the sun temple that was built many, many years, thousands of years before in our part of the world. Like, you know, this, the right side, you see the sun temple. I don't know when, uh, how many of you have seen, but if you come to India, uh, it is in Odisha. Uh, it's close to Bangladesh, actually. Uh, yes. This is a sun temple, Konark temple. Uh, in the state of Odisha and the sea coast, uh, West Bengal, um, uh, it's close to West Bengal and so on. So, but anyway, this is also a huge structure, and you can see the size of these people here with the structure. It is a um, very big structure, uh, uh, almost uh, you know, uh, 1500 years back, this was built. But today, what you see in the right side is a four meter uh, telescope that is being built in Hawaii. And these are all these people, <coughs> they are uh, they worked on this telescope. This is uh, almost ready this week. They are testing uh, the spectrograph to uh, uh, see whether the whole instrument is working or not. And then in a couple of months, we will be able to um, observe uh, the sun uh, with a, a uh, resolution of about 100 uh, kilometers on the surface of the sun, B much below 100 kilometers, maybe 80 kilometers or so, we will be able to observe on the surface of the sun. So um, uh, we will know many more things, how the gas is moving, how the structures that we are seeing on the sun are happening. So that's why I selected this. The other point, uh, there are many, uh, oh, there are many other uh, telescopes which are uh, we can call as a modern uh, sun temples in the United States. The uh, top two uh, are now not functioning so well, but these uh, uh, telescopes uh, um, worked for last uh, almost fifty. Mm, more than uh, 60, 70 years. They were built around 1950s. This is uh, at Kid Peak in Arizona, and this is uh, at uh, Shack Peak, 
uh, in New Mexico. So these are the two um, large telescopes that served the solar community. When I was uh, doing my PhD in India, I used to use these two telescopes to uh, work for my thesis and so on. But the bottom telescope is close to here in Los Angeles, uh, in Big Bear Lake, uh, close to um, our place. And this is 1.5 meter class telescope. It is uh, situated in the middle of a lake and um, uh, 1.5 meters. So we, it is still functioning very well. And uh, the, currently we are using to study various phenomena on the sun. The other um, big thing, uh, yeah, this, okay. Maybe this. Okay, the other big thing that has happened, uh, is happening now, is that we are sending uh, a uh, instrument which will go close to the sun. It is like, if you, some of you know, Indian mythology, this is uh, Lord Hanuman, who, you know, in his childhood, uh, he, he wakes up early in the morning and sees, uh, he was hungry, he sees the sun as a fruit, and then he jumped and ate the fruit. So he, he was the only guy, I think, who could jump and uh, eat eat the sun, but uh, went close to the sun. In Western mythology, there are similar stories, but uh, uh, now we are actually sending a instrument like this, which will go not exactly to the sun, but uh, very close, almost few kilometers to the sun and get it destroyed. So that is called the Parker probe. And that is uh, very close now. And in another uh, two years, it will be uh, almost inside the sun. So this is another big thing that is happening. The large ground-based telescope, and this is a telescope which is going close to the sun. So, so that is why I thought I'll uh, tell you um, something about the sun to generate some interest among you. And let me see if this movie, yeah, this movie is working. Can you see the movie? All of you? Yes, yes, sir. We can. Oh, you can see the movie. So um, uh, basically what you see in the movie is, a, um, uh, is the sun at the center, this uh, white uh, uh, circle is the sun at the center, and uh, uh, the black uh, part is the, the close by a, a regions of the sun is blocked by something called the coronagraph. And uh, what you see coming out is basically material from the sun that um, comes to the space, inter, uh, interplanetary space, and sometimes hits us. And these are called the coronal mass ejection. And these are uh, caused by the explosion of the, uh, uh, in the sun. And the explosion in the sun happens because there are concentrated uh, locations that have higher magnetic field. So, um, uh, in this talk, what I'm going to do is that I will tell you, um, I'll give you a little introduction about the sun and tell you what big questions we are going to uh, address in coming uh, years uh, using these uh, um, instruments and uh, what future uh, lies in this field. Some of you, uh, the students, if you want to mm, make a career in this field, uh, you should look into, mm, um, we, you, you should look, look into the opportunities that are coming up in this field. So uh, the sun is basically a, mm, a stable giant uh, ball, mainly of hydrogen. And here the uh, word stable is very important because if uh, this uh, hydro uh, if this hydrogen ball were not stable, then uh, no uh, none of these things could happen. And understanding why this uh, giant hydrogen ball is stable is a big achievement uh, of 20th century physics. 20th century physics developed uh, tools to understand uh, the tiny objects like the hydrogen atom, where you have only one proton and an electron moving around it. Uh, so that how that is stable, we understood developing 
uh, quantum physics and the same physics actually um, lets us understand enables us understand the stability of this giant hydrogen ball um, and that is um, when i was a student in uh, india professor s chandrasekhar uh, who got nobel prize for uh, astronomy came to our institute and he in one of his lectures he mentioned that this is the greatest uh, uh, achievement of 20th century that we are able to understand the tiny objects and the giant objects with the same set of physics and how that is i i might uh, be able to give you a little flavor but basically what happens is that this hydrogen ball um, uh, 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 rotates uh, differentially the equatorial uh, rotation is 2 kilometers per second uh, and in poles it rotates at uh, 1.2 uh, kilometers per second slower so and um, because of that the magnetic field uh, inside gets uh, entangled and um, you have solar cycle of 11 years and this uh, okay solar cycle of 11 years at the center of the sun it is about 28 million degree Kelvin and tremendous high density 1.5 into 10 to the 5 kilo, uh, kilograms per meter cube extremely um, high density and with this high temperature and high density the hydrogen atoms can come very close to each other and when they come very close to each other actually they overlap and they penetrate into each other and make one helium atom and then uh, they um, release energy in this process. This is called the nuclear fusion. Actually, last week, um, there was a news from United Kingdom that this uh, uh, process can be now um, du duplicated in the laboratory to produce energy. And this will be an enormous uh, uh, source of energy. Uh, we developed hydrogen bombs. That means they are not stable. You can just blast one of those uh, bombs uh, and release energy but that is those are not stable so now the, with this discovery in uh, with this uh, success in the united kingdom you can make devices in which you can generate energy in a stable way so uh, and this is done every second um, uh, uh, that converts 4.2 billion kilograms of hydrogen atom to energy and that's why you see the sun shining every day so this is uh, to understand this you need quantum physics and um, and uh, 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 the stability of the uh, atom also you need quantum physics so that's how this whole thing um, uh, with the modern science you can understand all these things with the same set of theories. So, um, so once the uh, photons are generated at the center, they flow outside, and it takes about um, two. Uh, it takes about uh, you know several thousand years to come out. Hundred and seventy thousand years to come out that photon um, that travels uh, about 0.885 solar radii. And uh, once they come out, the last few uh, miles, known as the radio uh, convective zone, this this one, the uh, charged particle uh, actually carries the photon outside, and so that's how you produce magnetic field. And uh, um, um, this this is the size of the Earth compared to the sun and um, uh, very tiny and you can see uh, with this process when the energy uh, is released from the surface of the sun in this process you actually observe various things like prominences and um, corona during the total solar eclipse and on the surface you see a lot of these structures like chromosphere filaments and everything.
And in the center, uh, when you go deeper into the solar atmosphere, you observe these uh, black patches and they are called the sunspots. So mostly these are the most interesting objects and we will be talking about them. Um, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so the uh, this is a little uh, quantitative. So uh, from the surface of the sun, which is which let us say zero kilometers, uh, that is known as the photosphere. So if you go outside now, um, of course, uh, in the daytime, and look at the sun, all the light that you are getting is from that. Uh, layer that is known as the photosphere and there you have this uh, these um, sunspots and above that uh, layer you have chromosphere where you see these uh, structures filigree structures filament structures and things like that and uh, mm, uh, so this is chromosphere because uh, you see colors here like yellow red color yellow color comes from helium and red color comes from uh, hydrogen and so on. And uh, when you go above, then you have transition regions, and then above that is a corona, uh, which you see only during total solar eclipses, or with the space instruments, uh, like the movie that I showed you earlier. And this corona is uh, very hot. Um, chromosphere is not that hot, and surface of the sun is about six. Uh, thousand degree Kelvin. So, <clears throat> as you can see, this is the height above the atmosphere, and this is the temperature in the y-axis. And you can see how the temperature increases uh, um, suddenly after a certain height to about million degree Kelvin. So, this is a big puzzle in astronomy, uh, solar astronomy. That is, the surface is six thousand degree Kelvin, and Corona is um, million degree Kelvin. Uh, it is as if, if I give you an analogy, it is as if the surface, uh, that is, you have a, uh, a hot plate, which is uh, at, say, um, 6,000 degree Kelvin, and the water that you put on the um, hot plate is at million degree Kelvin. And how can it happen? Um, so that we are trying to understand this is an outstanding problem uh, at this time. Um, okay. This is slow. And understanding these, uh, okay, understanding these are very important because, um, um, because the phenomena that happens on the sun affects us. And so affects us how uh, the uh, movie that I showed you, you could see the material flowing from the sun to us. And uh, these are called basically coronal mass ejections. And these coronal mass ejections, when um, that happens, actually that releases about uh, 10 to the power 32 Earths into the, uh, into the um, uh, interplanetary space that comes towards us, towards the Earth. And that is equivalent to one trillion Hiroshima. Hiroshima, one bomb was um, exploded and that you saw the uh, thing that happened. And uh, in one of these events, actually, one trillion Hiroshima energy is uh, released. And these are small events. There can be big events where uh, things may be much more severe. And that happens every uh, month almost uh, two to three times during solar maximum times and less time less during the solar minimum times um, and uh, these the mass is uh, enormous about 20 billion tons and speed at, uh, the, at the speed that uh, comes towards us is about uh, 1000 kilometers per second and when such things happen since sun is far away it is it is not as devastating as hiroshima um, but um, um, uh, but the satellites that we put outside the Earth for communication or many other things, they get damaged. And actually last week, you might have uh, heard from BBC and many other news uh, channels uh, carried this news when <clears throat> this Tesla 
the the SpaceX company um, was um, launching several satellites because of the solar flare, uh, solar coronal mass ejection. Um, those satellites were damaged only a couple of weeks back. So this this is a real problem, and that is why it is very important to study. Um, apart from the fundamental physics point of view, it is very important to study. Uh, these events, why this happens and when this can happen and what uh, precaution we can take. And uh, uh, so why this happens, what is the source of energy? It was uh, speculated many years back, um, almost uh, uh, 70 years back, and that uh, um, <coughs> the uh, how the so the question is how the energy is stored and released. So, um, uh, Fred Hoyle and Thomas Gold in 1959 um, did a, a, a back of the envelope calculation, and uh, they 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 said that you know if you take uh, 10 to the power uh, eight uh, centimeters of height, the energy storage is about 10 to the two Earths. Then you find that um, this is much more than you can. Uh, store energy thermally by just moving the electrons around uh, or the material around and that is only 10 hours um, you can uh, store. So there must be some other efficient way of storing energy and that is basically because of the magnetic field. Magnetic field can store energy uh, efficiently um, almost 10 to the 3 hours per centimeter cube. And so, uh, magnetic field is very important. Um, and the, the questions are why, uh, how these, uh, where this energy is stored, and how they are stored, and how they are triggered to release this energy. Uh, so the, uh, so, so to understand that, basically, uh, what we understand, uh, we need to understand are these black. Uh, uh, regions in the sun. The black regions in the sun uh, are known as the sunspots. So uh, rest of the lecture you will find uh, what these sunspots are and uh, um, 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 and my focus in uh, my research is understanding the properties of uh, three-dimensional properties of these objects on the sun. Sunspots are uh, black uh, uh, locations on the sun. They are enormous. They are very big. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so here you can see the size of the earth. <coughs> For comparison, this is a sunspot and this is the size of the earth. And these objects become more and more every 11 years. They, they On the surface of the sun, they um, appear more in number every 11 years. And uh, so that is known as the sun, sunspot cycle. So, for example, 2005, it was much more, and then it was less, then it was more. And now we are ascending stage. Now, uh, now it is something like this, actually. Um, what you saw around 1910, uh, we are somewhere here. And by 19, uh, 20, 50, 25, we will be at the maximum um, activity of the sunspot. So every 11 years, number of these black dots, black patches on the sun increases. And why they are black? Um, oh, this uh, running, this is a little. Yeah. Why they are black, mm, uh, which were actually seen uh, for the first time through a telescope by Galileo. In 1611, he actually, when he pointed his uh, telescope to the sun, he found that uh, there are the, it is not all that uh, smooth. There are these black uh, regions and he called the sunspot. So this was, you know, 400 years back, this, th these things were discovered. And uh, even today, after 400 years, or uh, almost 450, 500 years, we are trying to understand their property. So, if you look at these objects through uh, modern instruments like uh, 
filters which you will see the chromospheric structures you actually see them something like this there are two there there would be two black patches and connected by these loops and that looks similar to what you will see on the ground uh, 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 and the laboratory when you have a um, when you have a, a bar magnet and put iron file around it you will see something like this so this resembles the structure so must be magnetic field actually now we can uh, measure magnetic field and i'll tell you how precisely i'll tell you later but uh, uh, when you do a theoretical modeling you actually can see this is that uh, spot and you can see the magnetic field lines like these iron files connecting these two dots and uh, with uh, modern instruments from the space you can actually observe them like this so from the structure or morphology point of view you we know that these are uh, um, uh, 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 these things have magnetic field so galileo observed these black patches on the sun 400 years back but about 100 years back george hell in uh, um, california uh, los angeles near los angeles you have a um, observatory called the mount wilson observatory where george hell uh, observed the magnetic field how did he ma uh, uh, how did he measure magnetic field in the following way that he took a spectra of the sun uh, of the sunspot and found that whenever the slit is going through the sunspot the uh, spectral lines are split like this uh, um, uh, so here you see uh, when the slit is outside the sunspot there is no splitting and when it goes through the sunspot the line the spectral lines are split and uh, this was a big discovery actually this discovery was done in 1910 but about five six years back uh, in netherlands uh, there was a, a scientist called jiman peter jiman who um, discovered the same thing in the laboratory when you have a lamp and put magnetic field the uh, the spectral lines split and this is known as the Jiman splitting, splitting of spectral lines uh, due to magnetic field. And uh, for that, actually, Peter Jiman got Nobel Prize. One of the first Nobel Prize was given to uh, Peter Jiman for this discovery. So the same Jiman effect was um, used by George Hell to discover magnetic field on the sun 100 years back uh, in Los Angeles, where actually I'm working. Um, this changing the slides is taking quite a bit of time. So basically, then uh, um, in uh, 2010, to commemorate 100 years of this discovery, we organized a, um, uh, a symposium here in Los Angeles on the physics of the sun and sunspots. And I was the co-organizer uh, co of this uh, symposium. Here you can see George Hell doing this um, uh, experiment in Mount Wilson to measure the magnetic field. And this is uh, uh, what I told so far is that uh, these uh, magnetic fields are important to understand the coronal mass ejection. But in um, broader astronomy also, these are very important because many other stars uh, ha um, harbor magnetic field in the uh, many uh, many other stars in uh, HR diagram that means uh, at various stages of their uh, stellar evolution they harbor magnetic field so let me see whenever this thing changes oh. okay so let me then you know go a little faster because then it becomes easier so how to measure magnetic field is basically by measuring this um, uh, splitting of the spectral line and the sun so that is the Zeeman effect the splitting of spectral line emitted in the presence of magnetic uh, magnetic field so um, the history is a little bit given here uh, and you can see uh, two, uh, 1905 jiman uh, got nobel prize uh, for uh, discovering uh, this effect called jiman effect and hell gets uh, 
um, this uh, thing uh, to for the sun and discovers magnetic field. So the splitting of the spectral line directly depends on the magnetic field in Gauss and uh, and the um, uh, wavelength at which you are observing. And this G, the G, the G factor, which is basically typical uh, characteristic for a given spectral line. Um, uh, for example, for hydrogen, it will be different. For uh, helium, it will be different. For um, um, uh, calcium and iron and things like that, depending on the element, the G factor will differ. But you can choose um, uh, wavelength, uh, which is, you know, the splitting is proportional to the wavelength square. So if you are in optical wavelengths, um, then the splitting is less. And you go to higher infrared wavelengths, it is much more. Uh, so, yeah. so uh, and these lines, these split lines are polarized. So, it, the, these are split and these are polarized. So if you are looking at these uh, split components in the line of sight, if you, the magnetic field is aligned uh, with the line of sight um, that you are observing, then these are circularly polarized. And otherwise, they are. Uh, uh, if it is perpendicular, magnetic field is perpendicular to the line of sight, then that is known as the transverse magnetic field. And those are um, linearly polarized. So basically, we have a, a telescope. I mean, this is a simple laboratory experiment. Actually, in our department, we have an experimental setup like this, where we have a, a lamp, and then uh, you have this magnet, and inside the magnet, there is another lamp that is basically the source. And then you have this optics, uh, collimating and camera optics. And then you have uh, wave plates. And then you have filters and then the FabriPro um, uh, spectrograph, which actually splits these uh, spectra into very tiny parts. And you get these uh, 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 split components of uh, spectral lines that is present inside the magnetic field. Uh, and we are actually our students, they observe the splitting and then determine the magnetic field, which we are actually, we are basically simulating in the lab. And uh, the data uh, in the sun uh, looks something like this. These are photospheric and chromospheric lines. Okay, so these are not the movies anyway. So these are uh, photospheric and chromospheric lines. This is one of my um, data set that I have actually written a couple of papers, three papers we wrote on this data set. Uh, so this is the wavelength axis, and this is the spatial axis, and this is again the spatial axis. So we, uh, the, as you can see, these are the two sunspots we observed in uh, uh, in different lines, like iron lines, uh, 6301 uh, is in the left, which is generated at the solar uh, photosphere. And above that, in the chromosphere, the, uh, there are these other lines, like magnetic uh, magnesium lines. And uh, you can, uh, we observed that also. And use, uh, simultaneously, so using these two lines, you can uh, study how uh, the magnetic field is structured both at photosphere and chromosphere at the same time. And uh, this is uh, the um, instrument that I uh, used. Uh, this is at, in uh, New Mexico. This was many, many years back. So at that time, I used to look like this. This is one of my first observations that I made. And um, uh, and this was another telescope in uh, Alabama, where I uh, worked in NASA. This was this belonged to NASA, uh, so this was uh, my supervisor, and I was explaining her what I was doing. This was the telescope. Uh, so there also we used. There are many telescopes in the um, all over the world, and I used many of them uh, to make these measurements. And this one, the right top is in India, 
uh, the, where I worked for a couple of years, many, many years actually, 10 years or so. Uh, so um, this is a telescope which is in the middle of a lake, uh, Rajasthan, Udaipur. Um, and it's in the middle of the lake to get the best uh, uh, stable images of the sun. Now, um, at this location, there is a big telescope, almost 50 centimeter telescope. They have, um, as a modern instrument, they have installed. And they are doing the similar work that they measuring the magnetic field in the, near the sunspots. Uh, so, and these are uh, this is a telescope in uh, Arizona, and this is in Japan, Mitaga, uh, which for some uh, couple of years I worked uh, with that telescope in uh, Mitaga campus of uh, uh, National Solar Observatory, uh, Nes Astronomical Observatory of Japan. So the sunspots looks like this. Now you can actually simulate them in the laboratory in Boulder, uh, Colorado. There is, there is a group which actually can produce sunspots in the laboratory. So that means we understand the physics quite well. Uh, it's quite complex physics, but they are able to do that. So what I do is that I take these images of the sunspots in various wavelengths and uh, polarized uh, spectra and measure magnetic field. So the rest of the slides will show you some fun. So this is basically a, um, a sunspot. The dark area at the center is known as the umbra. The not so dark and filamentary area around the sunspot is known as the uh, penumbra, and uh, which you do not see uh, at the periphery of this image. There are some little objects uh, so that is known as the super penumbra. And in chromosphere, you can see the super penumbra quite well. So this is umbra and this is penumbra. And uh, the, uh, uh, the connections between the umbra and the uh, outside this uh, periphery of the field of view is known as the super penumbra. So that is in the um, calcium line, which is basically around 800 kilometers above the photosphere. And this is hydrogen alpha, which is slightly much, uh, slightly above. Um, so you can see in a uh, sunspot in uh, these chromospheric structures. So umbra and penumbra and then the super penumbra. So, <laughs> so these uh, uh, from this umbra, the penumbra and super penumbra are connected through these uh, uh, these uh, these fibrils, and uh, that is very uh, and in through those fibrils, when they are connected, the um, uh, matter sort of flows from inside to out, outside to in. Uh, that is inside the sunspot to outside and outside the sunspot to inside the sunspot. So this uh, uh, exchange of uh, uh, mass and uh, energy takes place. And that is very interesting. So this, I don't know. Uh, yeah, these movies, they do not work well. So, but anyway, so the question, question is that why the magnetic field is, uh, why the sunspots are dark and what is their magne uh, uh, magnetic field connections? So what is the structure of the sunspot? The two things that can happen is that there are uh, tubes of, uh, field, uh, magnetic field uh, channels, they are pressed together and you make something like, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll show you, um, like these onions, you can um, press together and make a monolith, uh, make a, a structure and that may be the sunspot or the whole thing is a giant uh, tube in which the in, uh, uh, magnetic field tube in which the uh, plasma is confined. So which is that? There are two conflicting views, and we are trying to um, uh, we, we are trying to isolate and, uh, and understand who what is the actual structure is. So um, what we have observed is that the flux emerges, and then they get collected at one point to make a sunspot, but after, uh, if you go through the plasma physics of this uh, uh, whole process, you can actually conclude that after these uh, tubes get uh, collected, you can make a monolithic uh, big tube and they don't have to remain 
um, remain uh, isolated. And these uh, um, deciding one way or the other, whether this whole thing is uh, um, consisting of individual tubes pressed together, or the whole thing is one giant magnetic block um, that has uh, consequences towards the stability and decay of the spots. That's why we need to understand what exactly is the structure. So uh, this is uh, uh, the Parker, Eugene Parker, actually, uh, 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 honoring whom we have uh, made that uh, telescope I showed in the beginning that is going to the sun. It is to honor the, uh, this uh, big scientist in uh, um, University of Chicago who um, gave that model of uh, sunspot. And also he uh, predicted the existence of solar wind uh, around 1948-50s. So that's why he is being honored. So the question is whether the sunspot consists of these individual tubes like these or the whole thing is one uh, full um, block of uh, sun. So when I was doing my uh, work, um, sometimes around 2010, I um, was discussing with him. He, he advised me that you know this is a quotation that clearly the observers must uh, observations must point the way because it is evident now that the sunspots are too complicated a structure to be produced by a single overwhelming theoretical effect. So the sunspot results from the conjunction of several effects. And we can spend a lot more guessing what those effects might be without getting anywhere if we are not guided by the observations. So observations are very important. That is what uh, Professor Eugene Parker uh, was, you know, mentioning. But you know, this is a very nice uh, uh, quotation that sums up the state of affairs. So I thought we should know. So what these uh, things tell us is that this is one of the um, uh, papers that we published many years back uh, using the data from the uh, from a space-based satellite known as the uh, Hinode, which is a Japanese uh, satellite which we used to uh, figure out the structure of sunspots. And you can see these are these uh, little dots here uh connected uh, from where the channels originate and goes outside and so when we uh, um, uh, analyzed almost 20 of these objects we made a lot of these conclusions and that the conclusions basically you know these are a lot many uh, technical conclusions but what it says is that uh, the structure it does not seem to be a single monolithic uh, magnetic block, but rather consists of these small, small uh, tubes uh, pressed together. That is what this pointed to. Uh, and then now we are doing this um, mapping, uh, thermal mapping of these individual spots. See, th see these, what you see, these structures, white structures in this movie are basically those individual uh, uh, spots. Can you? Oh, I think I lost. Are you able to see now? Yes, sir. We can see, but oh, yeah, maybe but... stop uh -huh. the. Uh, maybe you have stopped the full screen mode. Okay, now I'm. Yeah, now it's coming in. Okay, so basically we are doing this uh, to um, study the individual uh, thermal and magnetic structure of uh, those little channels that you saw in the previous slide. 
So uh, the model right now we are proposing and working on this is this that sunspot consists of um, these individual tubes like this through which uh, uh, and which are separated uh, by the uh, by the quiet plasma. Now these are magnetized plasma and in between you have quiet plasma <coughs> that oscillates up and down. And basically this is uh, uh, the heat flows from inside to outside. Mm, uh, and then you know sometimes this uh, this heating takes place. Uh, this is a very complex uh, picture this is from one of my publications. But basically uh, the take home message is that uh, sunspot consists of mostly these individual tubes of various sizes. Uh, uh, so the main points are that the sunspots are dark uh, and locations of inten uh, intense magnetic field and magnetic field is measured using Zeeman effect. The sunspots are the site of the events that alter the space weather. So they are very important and uh, the uh, observed properties can be best understood if the surf subsurface structures of the sunspot are porous. Um, and in, uh, interspaced with, with the convective, convective zone plasma. That means, uh, and that can happen only if you have uh, individual uh, tubes pressed together. So I think I'll uh, stop there and take any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you, sir, for your wonderful presentation. So we have got a few questions. If you allow, I can start our discussion session. The first question, is solar neutrino capture rate correlated with sunspot number? I'm sorry? Uh, is solar neutrino capture rate correlated with sunspot number? Yeah. Um, actually, even though this is not my field and I had uh, done, uh, I had some interest in this and then um, they are uh, not because, you know, the solar neutrino are produced uh, two ways. One is uh, when you have uh, this nuclear fusion at the center. Uh, that, that produces most of the neutrino and that does not change as a function of uh, uh, solar cycle. Solar cycle only you have uh, these uh, number of sunspots they become more. And when the number of sunspots become more then basically Sometimes uh, explosive events uh, occur, which lead to these um, uh, coronal mass ejection. During those uh, explosive events, there can be uh, nuclear uh, reactions in the surface of the sun. Those are called the Pelesian reactions, and uh, there might uh, during that time there can be some neutrinos, but those are not very significant. Um, this was studied by a very famous scientist in Princeton uh, called uh, uh, John Bacall, and he has written a paper in uh, Physical Review Letters many, many years back, showing that there is no enhancement during those events. So. Okay, thank you, sir. This may be the last question. So how neutrino could we reveal how the sun shines? Oh, yeah, that was uh, actually two Nobel Prize were uh, awarded for this uh, question already. That is, uh, mm, uh, uh, the observing the neutrinos, one could ascertain at what rate the nuclear fusion is going on at the center. Because you ask the question in a reverse way. So that's why I'm uh, replying this way, that uh, you can see how this uh, nuclear fusion is going on at the center. And that is precisely understood by doing this, uh, uh, by studying this. But the, actually the Nobel Prize was given the other way. That is uh, to understand the property of uh, the neutrino that are produced at the center of the sun and coming towards us. And so the measurements showed that all the measurements, the measurements in the United States by Davis and the measurements in Japan, um, uh, all these measurements, when you put them together, that clearly showed that there are these three flavors of the um, neutrinos and there are some oscillations and so on. The detailed properties of neutrino were uh, determined by using all these measurements that led to this Nobel Prize sometimes in early this century, I guess, by Davis and other people. Yeah. 
Okay, sir. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and discussion session. Uh, it was a great opportunity for our student. And the main aim of our program is to motivate our student. And I think by your exciting lecture, some of our students uh, already motivated. And hopefully, uh, they will join this research field later. So thanks again, sir, for giving us this opportunity. And hopefully, yeah, we can arrange there face to face. Yeah, you can circulate my email and uh, you know feel free course, to sir. contact me as much okay, uh, uh, okay, whenever sir. it is. Okay, okay sir. great. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Yeah. Bye, Good sir. Good night. Good night.